It's a pleasure to be here. It's not a pleasure to hold this microphone, but um, <laughs> uh, I love Pritzker Medical School. What can I say? <laughs> so, um, so I, but first let me tell you about what I do when I am in my lab, which is to look at whether there is a biological basis for empathy. Now, when I got into this game, it, I had sort of an assumption that I think a lot of people have, which is that empathy is a very cortical event. And we fancy humans are very special because we can put ourselves in other people's shoes and, and it is that that motivates us to be nice to other people. And I had a graduate student, um, Imbal uh, Benami Bartal, who was actually working in the psychology department with my colleague Jean Decidi. And they approached me about, let's see whether this assumption is correct. Maybe empathy is, in fact, a biological uh, process. And the, the, the way that we ask that question is we say, well, animals, animals don't have cognition. They're not doing math problems. They're not building businesses or uh, composing symphonies. They, they are biological creatures, and they do what their biology dictates. So let's ask the question of whether a rodent uh, can show empathy. Now, there had been some suggestions that rodents do show empathy. And the, the, the work that predated our work basically showed that if one rat, or one, um, excuse me, one mouse was expressing pain behavior, was showing that they hurt, that uh, another mouse seeing that would show even more pain behavior. Okay, and this is basically a version of one baby cries, all the baby cries. All right, so emotional contagion. And emotional contagion is interesting, and it's it's that's a you know that's a fascinating and, and marvelous finding, and and um, and yet it's an internal experience. It doesn't actually do anyone else any good. All right, so what we wanted to do was to try and use empathy as a motivation for an individual rat to actually do something. And the something that we wanted them to do was to help. So what we did was uh, we devised this, uh, this is a restrainer. This is what we call a restrainer. It's a little bit of a hyperbole because, in fact, the rat that is inside this uh, a plexiglass tube can actually turn around. So they're not particularly restrained. This is not a huge stressor. The rat inside would rather not be inside, but the rat inside is not freaked out. Okay? And I think actually that is one of the reasons this paradigm works. So these guys are cage mates, and uh, one of them is put into the restrainer, and the other one's put on the outside. Um, okay. And they're in this. Uh, arena, which is about yay big, uh, and we put the re restrainer in the middle of the arena. Now, in rat mind, middle of arena, very, very scary place. So it takes a lot of guts, a lot of de-stressing for the rat to move from the periphery, where they like to be, into the middle. And we did this for... Um, 60 minutes for 12 days. And what we saw was that eventually the rat, uh, well, actually not eventually, almost immediately, the rat headed for the restrainer. So it got over that distress at leaving the, the periphery of the, uh, of the arena and went in there and really tried to figure out what the heck is going on here. He's just like climbing on the restrainer, biting at the restrainer. There was a lot of um, tactile interaction between the trapped rat and the free rat. Um, in the end, <clears throat> there's a door here. And this door is uh, fashioned such that it can only be opened from the outside. So the only one that can get the trapped rat out is the free rat. And on average, by day six, the free rat does exactly that. Goes in, opens the door. And, um, and out comes the trap rat. Now let me say a couple things about that. First of all, the first time the free rat opens the door has no clue what he's doing. No clue. Why? Because he's not an engineer. He can't look at this and say, oh. 
<laughs> That's a good counterweight. I'm going for the other side. <laughs> so um, in, in fact, what he does is he just spends so much time there. He cares so much. He's, he is distressed um, that this guy is distressed. And uh, so he, he accidentally opens it. Well, the next day, he comes in to the same situation, but now he knows, ah, the business end is over by this door thing. So now he goes here, spends his energy there. Instead of opening it after 40 minutes, he opens it after 20 minutes. By day 12, what the rat does is he comes in, he races around, aha, same gig as yesterday, goes directly over the door, opens it within a minute. So, um, <clears throat> So that, that, um, that is one thing. The, the other thing I, I should mention about what this looks like is when the trapped rat gets out, he gets out and he actually, what he does is he races around the arena. Because he hasn't really been able to explore this arena. He's been trapped in the, in the plexiglass tube. Well, the free rat, it's, it's actually fascinating to watch. The free rat races after the trapped rat. It's like, I'm really excited that you're free. I'm really excited that you're free. And he raises around him, jumps on him, licks him. Um, and, it's, and it looks like the celebration. We didn't put that into our paper, but we call it. <laughs> in the lab, we call it the celebration. Um, and, uh, and so that suggested to us that while, while we, were, we were sure that what we had was a well-motivated pro-social behavior, well-motivated helping. But what we weren't sure was that it, wasn't, that it was motivated by empathy. And the biggest other possibility was that it was motivated because the free rat wants to play with the trap rat. And that was very, you know, that became very possible once we saw this celebration. So what we did is we put two arenas together. And there was a division between the arenas. And the, the restrainer, instead of being in the middle of one arena, it was up against that division. So when the free rat opened the door, the trap rat was released into a separate arena. We did this experiment for a very long time. <laughs> and my students were very unhappy. But um, we did it for, for three months. And we did it in counterbalanced order. When, when the restrainer was empty, the rat stopped opening the door. When the restrainer had um, a trap rat, he opened the door. Even though he did, he's doing this day after day for a month, and he realizes, after a few days at least, that he's never going to get to play with this guy. So that suggested to us that, at the very least, a social reward is not required for um, uh, for this helping behavior. And are there other possibilities? Um, there are other possibilities. One of the other possibilities, which I think is uh, that we've solved, is, is the, what I call the Mount Everest possibility, meaning they open the restrainer because the restrainer is there. Uh, that appears not to be true, because if the restrainer is either empty or it contains a toy rat from IKEA. Um, and that could be the problem. Uh, it, they don't open. <laughs> um, uh, and one other uh, possibility that people have raised is that this rat, the free rat opens the door because the trap rat is screaming so loudly and they just want to shut him up. This is sort of the, an aversion hypothesis. And we now have evidence that, in fact, um, it, that we had evidence originally that there are very, very few alarm calls. Um, and now we have evidence that in m most of the situations where the animal does open, there are no alarm calls. So um, that looks like it's not the case. So why the heck would rats do this? Um, and uh, I think that the reason is, uh, or I, I'm not the originator of this idea, this is a, a common idea across the field, is that mammals are altricial. That means the babies are born helpless. <clears throat> this is um, one of our rats. 
This is one of our litters. We're, we enjoyed them very much. Uh, and these rats, if this mom does not take care of these pups, they die. So mom has to be very sensitive to the pup's uh, needs, has to know when they're cold, when they're hungry, and when they're in danger of predation. And, um, and she has to be able to respond. And so the thought is that, in fact, this uh, process of empathic driven uh, um, helping behavior has been generalized from the mom's parental care of the pups. I want to say just a couple more things, and then I'll um, entertain your questions. Uh, one is that there are a lot of people that participate in this research, and including medical stu school students. So this is Tess Murray, and she did an experiment which showed that the free rat actually has to feel distressed. If I give the free, if, if when Tess gave the free rat essentially a chill pill, okay, <laughs> the free rat no longer cared. <laughs> So there has to be an, a, a degree of catching the other individual's distress. And she did, uh, Tess is a, a third year medical student. She did this part of scholarship and discovery. She'll be back in her fourth year um, to do another experiment. We haven't figured out which one she'll do, but she will. And, uh, and she, I mean, she's a member of, of my laboratory, and, and we're, I'm thrilled to have her. I'm thrilled to have other Pritzker students in my lab. Um, and finally, let me just say that I do, when I'm not in my lab, I do very much enjoy teaching Pritzker medical students. So I hope to see you in 17 months. And this is a picture of a very young student, in, um, uh, the daughter of uh, a second year medical student, who is getting a head start. <laughs> so thank you very much.